Sure. Good morning. My name is Ken Levinson. I'm the executive director of WIDA. Uh, we are thrilled to have so many of you here today. Uh, thankful, uh, grateful for our panelists. Uh, we've had a very busy year. Uh, some of you we've seen at a lot of our events uh, starting in January when we had our first policy event on the border adjustable tax. Uh, had a big crowd for that. We then addressed NAFTA and China, some other hot topics. Uh, we are today uh, talking about the enforcement toolbox. Uh, thanks to Terry for creating a slide deck for that. this presentation. There's been a lot of questions in the trade community about what we need to be doing, uh, what will be happening in this administration. Uh, Mr. Lighthizer had his confirmation hearing uh, just uh, last week on the, the snow day for some of us uh, sitting home watching on C-SPAN. Um, and I think we heard a little bit about that, but I think we'll hear a little bit more about what we might expect from the administration on the trade agenda. Um, we're going to have an event. Uh, you got a yellow flyer today uh, with apologies that we neglected to put the date in, but it's actually next Friday, March 31st, and we're going to be looking at the issue of trade balances, which is another topic that was covered to some extent uh, during uh, Mr. Lighthizer's hearing last week and is a topic that sort of undergirds in a lot of ways the conversation today. Uh, we have some notable economists, uh, Carolyn Freund from the Peterson Institute, Peter Morisi, who's done some advising for uh, the, the Trump administration and the Trump campaign and their transition, Rob Shapiro, and uh, former Ambassador Peter Allgaier, uh, Deputy USTR, is going to be moderating that discussion. Starting um, in April, we're going to be looking, uh, some of you may have seen some of the materials we've published on americastradepolicy.com, our blog about uh, we, the future of trade in an initiative we're doing called Next Gen Trade. And we're going to be kicking off a series of events to look towards the future of trade starting in April. We have an event where we're going to be looking at mega trends, mega cities, technology, and then we're going to be turning into uh, looking at global value chains and the future of business and the direction trade may head with technology, logistics, uh, advanced manufacturing, and some of those issues that uh, are starting to get ahead of I think, in some ways, the trade debate that we're, we've been having for several years to moving towards the future. So with that, we're going to turn the, the conversation over to our panel. Uh, Kristen Mori is our moderator today. Very grateful for all of you for uh, agreeing to do this today. Thanks so much. We'll have presentations. Uh, we'll have a discussion among the panelists, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Thanks. Kristen? Thanks, Ken. I appreciate it. Um, we have a, obviously a full uh, agenda here, and, uh, and I don't want to go over everyone's bios on the panel. I would encourage you, I know there's some law students in, in the audience today, um, but I would encourage all of you to read through the full bios of each of our panelists, because uh, I think for each of you, you've done such an amazing job of developing, obviously, your professional skills, but also incorporating your passions. And um, so it's, it's commendable. Uh, the 30,000 foot view for, for each of these um, to my immediate right is Terry Stewart of Stewart & Stewart, uh, one of the premier and most respected petitioners, lawyers in the bar. Um, he is, has experience at all levels, obviously the agencies, the Hill, the courts, and all the international organizations. And I think it's fair to say he's doing the real heavy, or has done the real heavy lifting in, in putting the slide deck together. So. I'm sure all of you will have lots to refer to um, from Terry Seth afterwards. Next, we have Stacey Ettinger of k &L Gates. Uh, she, of course, knows all aspects of trade remedies and trade policy from her time uh, in the Chief Counsel's Office at Import Administration, as well as Senior Policy Advisor to Senator Chuck Schumer. Full disclosure, in case you see a lot of softball questions, Stacey has been a very dear friend for more than 20 years, so uh, she's, I'm going to go easy on um, next, we have Dan Eikenson. Uh, and so, unless I think if any of you have been living under a rock, uh, you should know who he is. He should be very well known to all of you. Dan is the Director of Trade Policy Studies at Cato, and he's a frequent contributor to basically every major news organization, both in print and on television. So, um, we're delighted to have you here, Dan. And finally, my, um, my former colleague, Chuck Levy, Cassidy Levy Kent. We were together at Wilmer Hale. Oh a million years ago, it seems all right, too. Um, Chuck is a preeminent trade policy expert and practitioner. He served as legal counsel to members of Congress and the International Trade Commission, and his depth of experience and political savvy have led him to serve on numerous advisory committees for both USTR and the Department of State. Um, so I think we're, we're all in for a real treat. We are going to have questions uh, at the end so that each of you can 
tap into this genius that's up here. Um, so without further ado, Terry, I think we'll get started. Thanks, I'm just gonna, a quick note for folks who are scribbling notes furiously. Terry's deck is gonna be on our, is on our website, americastradepolicy.com, so you can take notes today, but you will also be able to see Terry's deck, and I think we'll try to get Stacy's up there as well on our website. Thanks, pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of talk uh, about the administration's trade policy, uh, its uh, focus on both trade remedies, uh, trade balance, uh, getting the quote unquote greater reciprocity from trading partners. Uh, and I think if you look at the uh, 2017 trade policy agenda, you can see it unfold first in their uh, uh, purpose. They identify what I would say are the would be typical uh, trade policy objectives for basically any administration, uh, increasing the welfare of the United States, opening markets, that sort of thing. If you take a look at key objectives, uh, you uh, kind of start to zero in on the problems that are of particular interest. And when you look at top priorities, the top two really uh, kind of are about today's uh, discussion. First, defending our national sovereignty over trade policy. Uh, and two, strictly enforcing U.S. trade laws. The others, uh, obviously, are also important. Uh, the first two uh, actually have to go hand in hand if you are going to, in fact, over time, uh, be able to strictly enforce U.S. trade laws. We have major problems uh, at the WTO in terms of a long series of decisions uh, that uh, are, have been weakening uh, U.S. law, despite the fact that uh, U.S. law was uh, the basic model upon which agreements that will model. So what can we expect in the coming years? Probably less than uh, those of us on the petitioner side would like, uh, but perhaps uh, more than uh, those on the respondent side would, uh, would care to see. Uh, obviously, many of the tools uh, that exist to deal with trade issues are for the government action, not for private sector, even if uh, private sector has the input that they can provide. Uh, historically, Governments, the U.S. government works with its trading partners bilaterally, informally, uh, to try to resolve a wide variety of uh, issues. It only goes to disputes where that can't be done. One can expect that we will see much the same thing happen uh, in the Trump administration, regardless of what the rhetoric might be. There are some very broad things that, are, that the president can do mm -hmm. under existing statutory authority, including a balance of payment exception. Uh, section 122 of the Trade Act of 74, which was basically put in after uh, Richard Nixon's uh, only time that the U.S. Uh, uh, used balance of payment exception. Uh, it's identified there. There is a recent Congressional Research Service paper that identifies all of the kind of statutory authority that the President has to increase tariffs uh, unilaterally. Uh, and from 1974 forward, uh, the President has had the unilateral authority to basically withdraw from agreements uh, based upon a uh, six-month time frame. For the private sector, there are basically six primary statutes. Uh, really, there are three that are primarily used. Uh, the others uh, exist, but uh, have uh, increasingly been rarely used. Dumping and countervailing duty laws, uh, the escape clause, which uh, has become a relic at this point, uh, having only been used, I think, once in the last 20 years. Uh, and Section 337, which has become a dominant uh, issue, uh, Section 232, which is a national security issue, and of course 301. 301 doesn't really get used as such much anymore, but all of the actions that the United States takes um, uh, tend to flow out of uh, Section 301 authority uh, in, in terms of WTO disputes and other disputes that we, uh, that we pursue. So quickly on the dumping law, for those of you who uh, are here and don't know what this law is, uh, I will, I will, I'm only going to minimize what I'm going to say. It basically deals with international price discrimination or exporting to the U.S. below full cost of production where there is injury to a domestic industry. The relief that you get if you meet those criteria uh, is simply prospective relief and it is simply the elimination or the neutralization of the unfair trade practice. I have in the presentation a lot of detailed issues that you'll have a chance to look at. Um, I guess what I would, uh, would, would, would focus on is that historically the largest users have been steel followed by chemicals, but virtually every sector of the U.S. manufacturing and a fair number of agricultural sectors 
I have at one time or another needed to use the loss, uh, and so it, it is an important part of, of the U.S. trade arsenal. Uh, Secretary Ross, uh, during his confirmation hearing, indicated that the administration might look to self-initiation. I would say that that is, uh, would be helpful in some sectors. Uh, increasingly, retaliation is a major concern that uh, dissuades industries from bringing cases. Uh, and often there are fragmented industries that can't bring cases because they can't get uh, past the standing hurdles that, uh, that are in the agreement. So self-initiation in those situations could be helpful. Uh, however, self-initiation um, doesn't uh, alleviate the burden on the industry to participate. Uh, and there are real concerns in terms of budget and in terms of missing people uh, in the current administration as to uh, how much you can do before you can deal with both of those issues. Countervail law deals with government subsidies uh, and basically has the same rights as you see under the dumping law. If, if you win the case, what you get uh, is basically offsetting duties to the uh, countervailable subsidies that have been identified. They kind of skip through to uh, uh, the, the, some of the advantages of the dumping countervail versus the other tools for private sector. First is the statutory time limits for investigations, which have been important to domestic industries. Second, the uh, outcome is not discretionary. That means if there is both dumping or subsidy and injury causation found, uh, the relief goes into place. It's not subject to executive branch uh, discretion to, uh, to deny. Uh, it's limited to products of interest to the domestic party or parties who bring the case. Uh, and as is true, most litigation uh, party obviously controls the timing of when the case gets brought. Challenges, uh, first is, a, is one that has crept up over the last 10 years, which is a lack of government statistics. As government has downsized an awful lot of industry data that used to be available <coughs> that would help industries decide whether or not there was a potential case no longer exists. Uh, second, relief is perspective only. And for many industries, that means that you are, you're fighting a downward game. You have to be injured before you can get relief. Uh, relief is for a period of years, uh, and you may need to go through multiple rounds of cases, which may mean that you never actually get back on your feet. Uh, third, you have fear of retaliation, which is a major concern, particularly with China. And fourth, the resources available to the agencies, uh, both uh, Commerce and the ITC, and Customs for that matter, in terms of enforcement. Uh, are typically uh, inadequate uh, and often restrict the ability of the agencies to actually get things done. Uh, and the costs of pursuing cases uh, in our system is very high, <coughs> which can discourage smaller industries from participating. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through the escape clause. The escape clause uh, is safeguard uh, has been part of U.S. law for, uh, for decades. Uh, and basically has been part of every uh, U.S. trade agreement, uh, a guarantee that industries would be able to get relief if imports searched uh, after an agreement was, uh, was entered into. They used to be, it used to be quite commonly used back in the 50s and 60s. Um, since uh, the 74 Act, I think there's only been 70 cases, and uh, since probably 1995, I think there's only been uh, one or two. Uh, so this is a law, while it's important, is largely uh, uh, become uh, non-used, uh, and in part that's due to WTO uh, case law, and in part it's due to the fact that it's, um, it has a higher standard, and at the end of the day is discretionary uh, with the president, and most presidents uh, have opted not to provide relief uh, absent particularly uh, important industries. Uh, and all of those things uh, have led to its being a relatively unused, uh, unused statute. Let me skip through. 337, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but it has, in fact, become a very important part of the uh, uh, arsenal for domestic industries facing uh, uh, import problems, uh, largely related to IP uh, issues, uh, although it also covers common law uh, Unfair trade practices, an important case at the commission at the moment looking at, uh, brought by U.S. Steel, is looking at uh, antitrust claims and whether the antitrust claims um, uh, should go forward is a, is a big issue at the commission at the present time. Uh, Section 232, I'm going to skip over. Uh, 
it's only really been used uh, um, effectively by the uh, by the oil sector, and, and I think only once or twice in the history of the law, going back to '62. So it's a national security exception, a very limited, uh, very limited set of rights. Section 301 is the uh, is the bulk of what the government does when you're looking outside the United States and problems that our industries have in terms of market access, in terms of compliance with obligations. Uh, and largely it is done now informally uh, where the administration will work with industries that have gotten congressional support uh, where there is a major problem, they bring the case themselves. The statute is broad, uh, it has both mandatory and discretionary aspects. The discretionary aspects have basically not been pursued in many years. Uh, there has been talk by the Trump administration that both 201 and 301 may be more aggressively used, and we'll see if that happens. Uh, we are obviously very active at the WTO uh, offensively. We're also very active there uh, defensively, um, since we face as many cases against us as we, as we bring, uh, and that poses some significant issues for us in terms of uh, whether the agreements that we negotiated or the agreements that we're being forced to live under. Uh, I think I'll stop.